Welcome to everybody. Thank you very much for joining us for this webinar. My name is Hayden Montgomery and I'm the Special Representative of the Global Research Alliance on Agricultural Greenhouse Gases. And it's my pleasure to, to open this webinar on embedding short-lived climate pollution mitigation objectives and livestock development strategies for scaled up action. And we're going to hear today about two case studies focused on Ethiopia and in Bangladesh. This event is really a, a continuation of a collaboration between uh, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, uh, the World Bank, the Global Research Alliance, uh, that has been running for, for many years um, and uh, focusing on supporting countries to scale up ambition to address, uh, in particular, of course, methane from uh, agricultural production systems. Um, today, we're focusing on, on livestock as one particular sector. And um, of course, in, in, with recent events, uh, methane has really become, uh, I guess, one of the major uh, focuses of climate action um, with, with uh, global methane assessments and, and, and the like coming out uh, recently and various other political commitments, which I'm sure we'll hear about at the COP. So um, the purpose of today is to really um, you know, explore in some, some detail um, some action on the ground that's been undertaken through some projects and, and hear from the, the people involved in those projects. Uh, and then of course, open up for, um, for questions and answers from you in the audience to our, to our panel members. Um, we have started a wee bit late, so I'll, I'll get straight into the agenda. Um, the first speaker of today um, to give us an overview on um, the global methane assessment that I just mentioned is, um, Dr. Drew uh, Schindel, who's Special Advisor for Action on Methane for the Climate and Clean Air Coalition. So I'd like to pass the microphone to you, Drew. The floor is yours. Thank you, Hayden, and thank you all for joining in. I'm happy to be here today and give you some of the highlights of the global methane assessment as they relate to the agricultural sector. If I could have the next slide, please. Just to start, not really on the agricultural sector, but to frame the big big picture here, is in order to stay on a 1.5 degree consistent pathway, you, you essentially have to reduce all of the greenhouse gases about as quickly as you can afford to do so. And given that methane is one of the most affordable pollutants to reduce, the cuts are very large in methane and occur very quickly. So what we find is that a 1.5 degree pathway, the, the median response is a 45% cut in methane by the end of this decade, by 2030. That is even, even faster than the pace, for example, of CO2, which is going down towards net zero by the middle of the century. The nice thing about reducing methane is that you get a large a dent in climate change, where which we calculate is about three tenths of a degree, just a decade after that, by, by adopting this 1.5 degree consistent trajectory for methane. At the same time, however, you get ozone responses even more rapidly. Right, this is about the fastest climate response we can get by any of the levers that are at our disposal. But it's even faster to get benefits from air pollution if we we'll reduce methane by 45% by 2030. All of the benefits on the screen there that are related to ozone, including roughly a quarter million deaths from respiratory and cardiovascular diseases, three quarter million asthma related hospital visits, and the bulk of those crop losses, which are attributable to ozone, all occur every year starting in 2030. Right? You'd even get some of those even before 2030 as you begin to phase down methane. The lost work hours there are due to heat exposure, so those require climate change to uh, have manifested itself, which tends to take more like two decades. But the point here is that while it would obviously be a challenge to reduce methane by 45%, if we do so, we reap enormous benefits. So the global methane assessment, if I could have the next slide, please, looked at how we might do this and achieve 45% cuts. And you can see here on the left, the far, the, bars are, the far left bar is our current methane emissions. They're projected to increase in the absence of greater will and policy levers. If, however, we put into place the targeted measures that we have looked at already and that are in place 
some parts of the world for agriculture there on the top, waste and fossil fuel sectors, we can turn that rise into a steep decrease. There are additional measures as well, which include things that are more behavioral changes and fuel switching, things like going to renewables and dietary change. But today I really want to focus on this top bar. It's not the biggest component uh, where we where we lower our methane emissions. There's many things that are easier and financially give higher returns in the fossil fuel sector. So that's where we find the biggest mitigation opportunity uh, for, within this current 2020s decade. But agriculture is still a large, a large mitigation opportunity, maybe 30 uh, megatons per year, which is quite a lot. Within that, the bulk of it comes from livestock on average, but the, the analyses vary substantially depending on who has done the analyses. The costs, however, are pretty uniformly fairly inexpensive. So let's advance, please, to the next slide, and we'll see a little bit more about how where we get these reductions. One thing that's really interesting about livestock, which is the second bar from the top here, the kind of pale blue color, is that livestock is leading to emissions that are pretty substantial almost everywhere on the planet, right? The numbers aren't so large for, say, Russia and the Middle East here, but they are pretty big most everywhere you look, whereas things like fossil fuels, oil and coal and gas are really highly focused on certain areas of the world. Livestock is most everywhere. So there's a room for action in both advanced countries and, and the developing world and everybody in between. And what we've looked at are some of the things that, that we know how to do. So if I could have the next slide, please. We'll go from where we need to act to how we might act. And this is a list of the measures that we looked at for the agricultural sector and to talk about livestock as the top two. One of the things to do is improve animal health and husbandry. And this is a, obviously a really attractive one because while it helps to reduce methane emissions, it also is clearly good for the ranchers and for the livestock themselves. So there are a lot of, of studies about how enteric fermentation and methane emissions can be reduced from enteric fermentation rather via feed changes, supplements, What's less clear are things like substituting higher productivity breeds, which is why there was such a large diversity in the previous slides numbers for mitigation potential, what, depending on whether we think uh, that's likely to happen in, in the developing world, but certainly improving animal health and fertility is going to be something that uh, nobody would object to if we can manage to get that done. And then there's, there's a separate category of mitigating emissions from manure. Um, that, that can also provide nice benefits for those putting the policies into the place, the same way improving herd health does. For example, man manure treatment with biogas bio digesters provides a source of power, which especially in remote areas can be uh, much less expensive than bringing in power from some distant location. If I could go to the last slide, please. I just wanted to make you aware of one additional resource, which is the, the web link is over there on the right. So given especially the diversity and estimates of mitigation potential within the livestock sector, we have an online tool where anyone who is interested can go look at the different analyses of livestock. I have one on the screen from a Dutch uh, consortium and you can sort the measures by their cost and by region. So we happen to be looking at their estimate of measures that are available at any cost in the Asia Pacific region. And then what happens to be on the screen are the labor impacts, but you can look at what all of the different benefits are as well as the cost for your given type of, of mitigation, your location, and whether you've screened by low cost, negative cost, or uh, regardless of cost, you can find the, what the average is within that cost range. So hopefully this is a nice resource for people. I encourage you to check it out and let us know if there's further information that you'd like uh, related to this. But, but 
I guess the bottom line here is that we find that livestock abatement of methane emissions from livestock is a modest but vital portion of the overall transition towards a 1.5 degree consistent pathway, which requires a dramatic reduction in methane emissions. So I'm looking forward to hear what, what's been done on the ground, and hopefully that helps set the stage from that. Back to you, Hayden. Thank you. Thanks, Drew. It's a modest but vital, very good way to capture that. Um, just to remind everyone, if you have questions uh, that have arisen from each of these presentations, please feel free to put those into the chat. Um, we will come to a question and answer session after the panelists have spoken. Um, so, you know, we will we'll raise the questions then, but please do enter them as you think of them. Um, with that, I'd now like to invite our next uh, speaker, uh, Mr. Martin van Nukup from uh, the World Bank. He's the Global Director for the Agriculture and Food Global Practice. And he's going to talk to us about the uh, state of international financial institutions investment in sustainable livestock. Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Hayden, and greetings from uh, Washington, D.C. And I'm pleased to provide a few reflections on the state of the World Bank investments in sustainable livestock. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? So let me start by saying you know, that when you look at UN and the international fora, I mean, the World Bank engagement or the media, I mean, climate change is really on, you know, among the top issues on the agenda. And livestock is singled out as an important sector where efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions are urgently needed I mean, to take place. I mean, we get many actually letters from all kinds of organizations asking the best position on financing livestock. Of course, for the agriculture and food global practice that I lead in the World Bank Group, I mean, this means we cannot invest in the sector as we did 10 years ago. So addressing climate change issues must be ma mainstreamed, I mean, throughout our operations. And I want to have, you know, provide a reflection of that. Next slide, please. Now, the bank's overall vision for the agriculture and food sector is that it needs to simultaneously support, I mean, healthy people, a healthy planet, and a healthy economy. And livestock, we think livestock can make an important contribution with respect to all those three dimensions. Now, when it comes to healthy people, uh, this would include the contribution of livestock, I mean, to diets, food security, and nutrition. I mean, livestock supplies about 26% of protein globally, and most importantly, many micronutrients. It also includes the contribution of the livestock sector to the improvement of food safety and the prevention of zoonosis and proving the antimicrobial resistance. And more than six out of 10 infectious diseases in humans are originating in animals. When it comes to healthy planets, I mean, of course, this includes the livestock sector contribution to climate change mitigation sustainable land management, especially of grasslands, but also feed crops, and of course, pollution control when it comes to man manure management and, and drug residues. And certainly when it comes to healthy economies, I mean, livestock is an important asset, I mean, for the poor. I mean, 1 billion smallholder far, uh, food producers across Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia rely on livestock, I mean, for their livelihoods. Um, as such, it contributes very significantly to shared prosperity, as well as the gender agenda, uh, as there are many opportunities for women and youth, employment and entrepreneurship and livestock related production and processing activities. Uh, and Kathleen, you might want to click on that slide because I think there's an animation here. Um, and this is not new. I mean, the World Bank Group, as you see, uh, has looked at various dimensions and implications of livestock development since more than two decades. Uh, so we've been working on that for quite some time. Next slide. Despite some stagnation observed for a limited number of commodities, particularly beef, in particular countries, particularly Western Europe, I mean, the growth of the livestock sector continues to be strong in low and middle income countries, uh, driven by, of course, economic growth, urbanization, and population growth. And to respond to this growing demand, I mean, it requires investments in productive assets, I mean, research, education, and knowledge as well as the need for enabling policies. As a result, what you see, or what we see, more countries and private companies call the World Bank Group, including the IFC for financial and technical support. So we face more demand from clients, at the same time we're receiving more letters from civil societies, what the bank is doing 
livestock financing. Um, so the question then for the World Bank Group is, you know, how can we respond to these requests and use this as, that op as an opportunity, I mean, to drive the sector on a more sustainable growth path? Next slide. Yes. So to address this challenge, I mean, we equipped ourselves with a set of institutional processes and corporate requirements that allow us to more systematically assess and mainstream adaptation and mitigation in project design and evaluation. And those processes and, and requirements are mandatory for all our investment projects and cover climate and disaster risk screening, greenhouse gas accounting, and using a shadow price of carbon to the tune of uh, $40 a ton uh, these days in our economic and uh, cost benefit analysis of projects, link climate finance tracking to determine the co benefits of our financing and the use of dedicated climate indicators for monitoring. Next slide. Now, as a result, I mean, we have been uh, able to respond positively to the client's request for investment support in the livestock sector. As you see, our financing increased from an average of about 150 million of new financing engagement per year in 2010, I mean, to about $700 million per year over the last three years per year. And at the same time, by doing so, we have been able to generate considerable, considerable climate co-benefits um, to the tune of 61% of the investment, I mean, to mitigation and adaptation outcomes. And that actually compares very favorable, I mean, to the corporate target that the bank has set for itself of 25%, as well as the average in the agriculture and food global practice, uh, the last figures that we have is 57%. So actually, the livestock portfolio is doing better than bank average and doing better than agriculture and food lending average. The next slide. Now, in practice, there are three main entry points on which we rely to reduce net greenhouse gas emissions in our livestock project. I mean, the first entry point is to increase efficiency and decrease greenhouse gas emissions intensity to improve livestock management practices. Um, the second entry point is to increase soil carbon sequestration to improve grazing management practices. Um, agriculture actually is one of the few sectors that can actually reduce the amount of greenhouse gas emission in the atmosphere, you know, up to uh, carbon sequestration. This is a key mitigation strategy when dealing with extensive systems relying on the management of vast degraded pasture areas. Of course, the third entry point, of course, is the, adop adop the adoption of energy efficient equipment, cooling, and the production of renewable energy, solar and wind to reduce and displace fossil fuel energy consumption. Uh, doing so would also limit in the emissions per unit of uh, product. Next slide, please. Now, I think this is the most important slide of the presentation. Um, a key lesson is that investing in adaptation and mitigation in livestock actually makes, I mean, um, huge economic sense. I mean, if this slide shows, I mean, uh, for a number of projects in a number of countries, I mean, the project, the project development objective, the volume of financing, the economic and the financial returns and the climate co-benefits. Uh, and it shows that both the financial and the economic internal rate of return are extremely attractive if adaptation and mitigation measures are included in the design of livestock um, investments. And we, and we also generate significant climate co benefits, raising from 37% to 64%. Uh, and of course, the projects in Bangladesh and Ethiopia, which were prepared by, um, uh, with the help of grants from the climate and clean air coalitions, are two operations uh, that uh, Pierre will talk about later in the program today. Next slide. Now, also important to note is that the scientific field of understanding, measuring and reducing greenhouse gas emissions in agriculture is rapidly evolving, along with best practice implementation and arrangement. And in view of this, you know, mainstreaming climate objectives in operations requires, and that's what we're doing, 
equipping bank project teams and clients with adequate tools and resources. And one good reference to this effect is the Investing in Sustainable Lifestyle Guide, guide that we develop. I mean, this is a practical tool and an information resource for building sustainable lifestyle production systems. Uh, we also produce specific resources and good practice notes for World Bank Group teams, Livestock Connect, and a note on animal health risk. And finally, the Agriculture and Food Law Practice participates and facilitates selected networks I mean, to ensure alignment and access to cutting edge practices and latest lessons learned in, the rapid, in this rapidly evolving field. Uh, so we very much engage on translating I mean, concepts in operational applications um, for task teams and clients. Final slide. Next slide. So in summary, um, you know, the request from client countries for bank support to livestock operations have significantly increased and are expected to maintain at high levels moving forward. In responding to this request, I mean, the banks find an opportunity to support clients to promote fairer, safer, and more sustainable livestock uh, production. And I think the examples we provided are uh, a manifestation of that. This requires the design of projects that explicitly menace, I mean, production levels and practices in ways that address adverse and impacts on land and water and the environment and the risk posed to animal and human health. And lastly, an important entry point in this respect is to take advantage of the diversity of systems and value chains by which animal source foods are produced and take this into account by tailoring the design of projects to local conditions with aim to maximize their benefits, I mean, to our clients. Uh, but this is for my side. Uh, back to you. Uh, thank you. Right, thanks, Martin. And it's really good to see the um, the more recent uptick in investment in livestock comparatively. Right, um, I recall, well, maybe only three years ago, the, the story was quite different. It was you know well under invested and in, uh, compared to other uh, subsectors of agriculture and then agriculture vis a vis other sectors in the economy. So it's it's good to see people are, are turning towards um, in, in livestock as an investment option. Um, now we turn to the, uh, I guess, the case study part of this uh, webinar, and um, the first of our two case study presenters is uh, from the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, uh, Mr. Amarle Uizeye, uh, is a Livestock Policy Officer, who will talk to us about low-cost strategies to reduce enteric methane and present some results from uh, CCAC-supported studies in Ethiopia and Bangladesh. So, Amarle, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Uh, can you confirm that you can see the screen? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you, Hayden, for the introduction. It is my pleasure to address you on uh, this presentation, uh, mainly focusing on low cost strategies to reduce antimethan in the systems, case studies from Ethiopia and Bangladesh. So this study has been uh, uh, supported uh, through a project funded by the CCAC uh, with uh, uh, the funding also from the New Zealand government and the FAO. And so it's been implemented uh, by FAO national uh, officials from uh, Bangladesh and uh, Ethiopia, as well as the contribution of uh, GRA. Uh, my presentation will be around 10 minutes and I will focus mainly on uh, explaining the approaches that was used, the definition of the risk production systems, the key outputs, uh, mainly on uh, the super emissions by countries, but also on emission intensity. Uh, and then I will discuss uh, quickly uh, the different mitigation options that were tested. Uh, and also, I acknowledge uh, the large contribution of my colleagues here in FAO in conducting this analysis. In the process, uh, the first step was mainly to, to do a consultation with uh, uh, the national officials, mainly to identify the existing resources, the data, uh, but also to understand uh, what uh, would be the best mitigation options uh, that can be provide much more benefit. In, in, in Bangladesh and in Georgia. Uh, and I would say that uh, most of those mitigation options that were selected were uh, uh, mainly proven to be effective in uh, different 
uh, research uh, uh, thesis. And also uh, we evaluated uh, the adoption rates uh, to ensure that those mitigation can be adopted across production systems and also the applicability uh, in uh, to different animal categories, but also to uh, different agroecological zones. And in this, in this analysis, we assumed no change in the uh, system. So we, we, we assumed that the, the, the share of each production system will stay the same. So the present is, let me start by Ethiopia. In Ethiopia, uh, we defined four production systems. Uh, the main production system in Ethiopia in terms of dairy production is the mi rural mixed crop livestock, which represents around 63% with uh, uh, a milk production of uh, around 72%. It's followed by the pastoral and the pastoral system, which represent a share of 36% with uh, a, an amount of milk production around 24%. So there are two main, uh, two uh, evolving systems that are commercial, the small scale commercial and the medium commercial uh, that represent around 1% in Ethiopia, but of course with the different characteristics when it comes to uh, feed, uh, access to feed and feed quality and so on. So uh, we found out that uh, in uh, 2013 in Ethiopia, the agriculture sector emitted around 116 million ton of carbon equivalents. And this represents a large share of antic methane, which was around 87%. Other emission of methane, for instance, uh, originated from manure, uh, as well as uh, the emission of uh, N2O, contributed around 12%. When we look at uh, the emission intensity, uh, we see that most of uh, uh, the emission intensity are quite uh, higher in the pastoral and agro-pastoral systems. Uh, this is related, mainly related to the type of uh, feed. So the animals in uh, pastoral and agro-pastoral systems depend mainly on natural resources. And usually uh, the quality of, uh, of uh, uh, grasses that are raised are usually uh, very low which has a huge potential in terms of energy loss because the digestibility are quite low. So when you look at the rural mixed uh, uh, crop uh, livestock systems, the emission intensity of course are also very high when you compare that to the, to the uh, global average, but uh, they are quite low as compared to the pastoral systems. And uh, with, as I said, the main uh, the concentration course of the milk production in Ethiopia are in these systems. The small scale, commercial, or medium scale, uh, are, they, they have an advantage of, of accessing a high quality feed, and of course the emission intensity in those systems are quite low. So this uh, uh, here we represent the relationship between the milk production and the emission intensity, and you can see that the pastoral systems and uh, the little mixed crop systems, which are really concentrated in the hand of uh, small holders, are the one with the high emission intensities and low productivity. Of course, in the mitigation options that we've tested, we want to see how the mitigation will also support those systems in enhancing the productivity of the animals. So, next slide. So here, uh, in terms of mitigation, uh, the mitigation uh, focused mainly on uh, the supplementation of feed, so they are mainly considered around the feeding strategies. So we looked at uh, uh, the in, in supplementation with legumes or other uh, nutrient dense crops, uh, mainly using urea or molasses, or treating uh, the, the stores, which is the largest available uh, resources in, in Ethiopia. If we treat it so, uh, so with urea by increasing, of course, the, the protein content of the soil and the uh, fermentation with uh, the different concentrates. So if you look at uh, uh, the in Ethiopia, you see that, of course, the mitigation potential are quite large, especially in the rural mixed crop types of systems where uh, the mitigation, especially looking at uh, the, 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 the supplementation by uh, uh, straw with urea or by concentrates 
can reduce sensitive enteric methane by more than 43%. So in other systems, uh, the reduction is quite substantial as well, but a bit of a little bit lower, and they are around 26%. When uh, it comes to the fast flow system, we see that one of the, the options that's possible is mainly uh, the, the uh, supplementation with legumes, so adding legumes in uh, uh, natural range lands. Uh, however, of course, we see that uh, that uh, is uh, quite uh, uh, interesting as a mitigation option, but the implementation is quite difficult. So, so on the other hand, uh, we only look at the profitability, so they, they mainly looking at the return. So if, if you invest in a mitigation option in Ethiopia, how much money do you get out of it? So we see that for every dollar invested, at least the, the, any mitigation option you choose, you can recover up, up to $3. Of course, this uh, uh, is, uh, I would say, uh, one way of looking at this, but we, of course we need to look at how much time, how what is the adoption, because most of those mitigation options may, may not be applicable to all farmers. So we need a certain level of adoption and also that, that may take some time. So uh, moving to Bangladesh, in the Bangladesh, the production system are quite uh, divided in two main production systems. There's a citizens-based system and the commercial one. So the commercial represents 10% and the subsistence system represents 90%, and uh, it's the one contributing more mainly to the milk production in Bangladesh. We conducted the same analysis from Bangladesh, and we see that uh, the emission in Bangladesh are 52 million ton uh, CO2 equivalent, which is uh, uh, almost half of what we see in Ethiopia. And uh, the methane emissions are also very high, uh, around 79%. This is very interesting, I think, because uh, uh, the discussion and the presentation we had earlier, where methane is uh, most, most important if you want to address a climate change in the livestock sector, addressing methane will provide, of course, large benefits, especially in developing countries. So in this relationship here, we see, of course, that uh, uh, with the intensification of uh, the system, the emission density tends to be lower, and this is mainly related to the quality of feed uh, and also the different feed resources used, as well as the improvement in animal breed of the animals. So when uh, we look at the mitigation, so the mitigation are quite uh, they say uh, the outcome of mitigation options in the Bangladesh were quite low as compared to the Ethiopian ones. We see that the most uh, uh, relevant mitigation was the balanced feed ratio, where the reduction was around 26 to, to 28 percent, while the other mitigation options provide benefit up to 10 percent. So this is mainly related, of course, to this current structure of the systems, the different feed resources, as well as uh, the, the already existing practices in, in, in Bangladesh. So similarly to Ethiopia, we see that any mitigation option, of course, adopted in those production systems has a direct positive benefit uh, in terms of uh, the return on investment, with on average around two dollar of return for every dollar invested. In the conclusion, I would say that uh, the benefit of moving to a climate resilient and low carbon growth uh, path to the dairy sector. This uh, uh, includes increasing the productivity, profitability, nutrition, uh, poverty reduction, and the livelihood of farmers. And there is an, a need to adopt performance enhancing technologies and use incentives to increase meat yield, but also to reduce emissions. So the mit mitigating methane, of course, provides the large benefit both for uh, food security and also on uh, the achievement of the Paris Agreement and the SDGs. And I would say that uh, some of those mitigation uh, tested in uh, Bangladesh and Ethiopia uh, are very effective, but today we are seeing mainly in science new options that are very uh, uh, important with large reduction that may, may provide much more benefits 
in, in the future. So I want to finish this by collecting all the colleagues have contributed. Over to you, Ivan. Thank you, Mavle. That's great. And we're really bang on time in terms of the uh, presentation. So thanks to everyone for that. Um, we'll now turn to the second of the, I guess, more case study focused presentations. Um, this will be from Pierre Gerber, who's a senior livestock specialist at the World Bank Group. And Pierre's going to talk about mainstreaming agricultural short-lived climate pollutants reduction measures into large-scale agricultural investments. And I guess we'll hear from some of those that Martin mentioned in his presentation. So, Pierre, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Hayden, and uh, thanks for hosting this, uh, this event uh, to the CCAC. Yeah, so uh, you can go straight to the next line, Catalina, please. I'll take it from, from a slide uh, <clears throat> already presented by Martin uh, on, on the entry points that, uh, that we're looking at for, for mitigation. And, uh, and I dwell into the, uh, the process really of delivering uh, this, uh, this mitigation uh, with, of course, a reference to those two uh, projects and countries that Emab talked about, Bangladesh and uh, Ethiopia. Go ahead, please. Uh, next slide. So, <clears throat> the the contribution uh, from the CCC was really instrumental in, in starting this process, right? From uh, knowledge development uh, analysis to the design of uh, investment operations and the implementation support, uh, then on <clears throat> into exploring a uh, potential of uh, link with the climate finance as a long term, if you want, incentive uh, to, to mitigation. So, uh, very instrumental to kick up that process and, and I'll, I'll expose that a little bit for, for the two countries. Next slide. <clears throat> Emable uh, gave all the details already on, on the analysis, what was done uh, in the context here of Bangladesh. Um, so, we'll not go into the details. I'll just add that <clears throat> the, uh, the fact that this study was done helped really building the uh, the awareness about emission processes, mitigation potential, and build also the level of comfort uh, on the side of the client that we could really make some progress on that line and align what is doing, what is being done in the ag sector with the national commitments. So that was also very important on that side in terms of awareness raising and, and creating the confidence. Next slide, please. So, <clears throat> Based on that, uh, we could really design an operation which, uh, which really mainstream throughout uh, the uh, climate co-benefits in terms of adaptation and mitigation. Uh, <clears throat> you, you see on the, on the right-hand side the uh, reduction pathways that um, we had identified, and, and, and here we're talking about mixed systems. So, uh, as presented by MAB, they focus on efficiency improvement at the animal level, waste management and renewable energy sources uh, and energy efficiency in, in the value chain, right? Um, that was mainstream in the activities in terms of extension services, practices, demonstration, et cetera. Um, it was reflected also uh, thereafter in the uh, monitoring and evaluation uh, framework of the project uh, with uh, specific indicators uh, for uh, reduction uh, of GHG emissions per unit of milk and beef produced. So you see it was quite ambitious, 40%. We actually had to downscale a little bit the ambition here at midterm review and, and move the needle down to 25%. And we can come back to, during, to that during the discussion if you, if you want. The other thing we could include um, uh, really uh, as an indicator is the establishment of uh, renewable energy uh, production systems uh, in, in, in project areas. Um, the core benefits Martin introduced was what they are, was, was uh, uh, evaluated at 60% for this operation. So this was really a first in terms of uh, uh, in mainstreaming uh, mitigation adaptation in the livestock operation. It was the first in terms of this uh, indicator for uh, emission intensity. And I think also probably for livestock operation at the time it was the highest good benefit we got. Next slide. And then after that, uh, and, and during preparation and implementation, we collaborated with colleagues at the Climate Change Group in, at the World Bank to see how we could help uh, the government, the, the country, uh, reap the benefit, if you want, uh, of the mitigation effect uh, delivered by this program and others. 
So one thing we did is to refine uh, uh, the, the baseline analysis that had been done under the, the CSC, CCSC grant. And, and you can see here the, the new curve we, we obtained in, in blue, and that was done through, through household surveys that we could conduct. So, so um, the, the mitigation potential was estimated at 2.5 to 5.5 million tons of CO2 equivalent over five years. You could put that in relation to uh, the 12 million ton uh, CO2 equivalent reduction uh, per year uh, compared to the BIU uh, from 2030 that is in the NDC of the country. Not calculated exactly in the same way, but that gives you a sense of, of, uh, of, of dimension, of, of size, of the contribution. Um, importantly, uh, the program here uh, only kind of addresses about 15% of the national cattle herd, so the, the potential to replicate uh, the approaches uh, to a much larger uh, population of, of producers and, and uh, population of animals is very important. So uh, now on, the discussions are about how uh, the country can uh, certify this emission reduction how the, the process can be established to, uh, to create a warehouse for mitigation assets and how that can be linked for uh, international transactions that could indeed kind of fuel this, this mitigation incentive over time. Next slide. I move quickly to, um, to, uh, to Ethiopia. I will not go into the analysis because uh, Emable has done that uh, very well. Uh, but just to say that here too, uh, this analysis, the uh, awareness raising, the trust build, allow us to design a very ambitious uh, operation in terms of mitigation and adaptation. Uh, you see the activities here that were included in the design, uh, capacity development on climate smart agriculture, support to the development of good animal husbandry practices that were tested against their mitigation effect, uh, and development of tier two uh, emission factors for the cattle and, and small ruminants that are going to be now integrated in national inventory reports. Um, here too, uh, we were able to uh, include in the result framework so many indicators specific to mitigation and adaptation. Um, the number of farmers that have accessed uh, uh, CSA technologies uh, and also uh, the reduction in JG emissions per unit product. And here we were uh, more conservative, 30% uh, only, uh, but I must say that in that case, we, uh, we seem to be overachieving because the preliminary results show that we should be uh, closer to a 50% than to a 30%. The climate change co-benefits were uh, uh, evaluated at 64% in that case. Next slide. And <clears throat> again here, um, we uh, use the, the, uh, this whole you know, kind of process of building a, a trust, moving into the investment, to, to have a dialogue with the, the climate finance. And, and in that case, we work with the biocarbon fund. And uh, so it's a carbon, it's a fund that, that uh, uh, purchase mitigation offset, if you want, at the jurisdiction level. So the purchase offset coming from uh, administrative units, regions, uh, departments, and so on. Um, and not only in, in, in Ethiopia, but in a number of countries, but we use Ethiopia here uh, uh, as a demonstration case and as a case to calibrate the, the, the work. Um, the, the problem was that uh, the carbon front was confronted to situations where livestock production was growing rapidly in some of their jurisdiction and thereby, despite reduction in emission intensity, the, the, the sheer growth of the sector was overtaking, if you want, the emission intensity reduction. So as a whole, the result was an increase in emissions uh, in those jurisdictions. And, and that was something that was harming, if you want, the performance of the, of the program and going against achievements made in other sectors like, like forestry, for example. So the uh, problem was that not only it was kind of, a, uh, kind of compromising the, the progress of the, the fund as a whole, but it was also not sending the right signal to the livestock sector because this, the, 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 the the fund was not able to, to devise, if you want, an incentive that would work for the livestock sector and would foster emission intensity reduction in the sector. So we worked closely with the, 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 uh, the, the carbon uh, finance uh, specialist uh, there and, and, and colleagues uh, in, in finance to devise a system where uh, in certain cases, uh, and you see here the uh, eligibility criteria, and within a certain cap, uh, we could use emissions intensity based accounting for the livestock sector within that jurisdiction based accounting. So it's a bit technical, but 
that really allowed the program to now uh, provide incentives to, to the livestock sector where it was not really able to do so before. So a uh, quite quite important uh, outcome, and, and it's now used not only in Oromia but in, in other areas where the biocarbon front is active. I will go ahead to the next slide. Yeah, so I mentioned quite a bit of climate finance. Um, I have a little time left, so so quickly. There are definitely some obstacles uh, that that are preventing uh, participation uh, of livestock sector in climate finance. Uh, they relate to the fragmentation of the sector and, and transaction costs to service a large number of producers. They relate to data uh, and, and, and knowledge about mitigation approaches. They relate to MLD, obviously, but also to building trust uh, in, in your system. Next slide. And if you are uh, interested to read more about that and, and about the good news also on how we can circumvent these obstacles, uh, and still link uh, the, the livestock sector to climate finance. Uh, this is a report we, we released a few months back and, and you may want, want to take a look at it. We are working on that direction in, in case studies uh, in Kenya and in Colombia at the moment. Next slide. <clears throat> so four lessons learned when it comes to mainstreaming mitigation in the livestock portfolio. First, uh, really uh, building confidence uh, analyzing options, providing TA, and that's back to the CCAC grant is extremely important in helping the client turn these high level commitments at NDC level into practice change uh, uh, in the sector. The second point is that as, as we perfectly know, changing practices, changing technology is a long and a tedious process. So we really have to work on aligning a number of intervention. Importantly, work on public support, public policies, uh, shift them towards uh, the delivery of, uh, of those outcomes and, and others that are desirable, work on extension, work on access to finance, etc. So those things really need to converge, otherwise we, we probably don't see a change. Third point, uh, it is still a fresh uh, area, and so monitoring and measurement of the result is important to demonstrate results, to demonstrate the feasibility, to show the limits, uh, but also, of course, if we want to link to climate finance, so in order to uh, uh, tap into new incentive uh, options that, that we have for the sector. And, and finally, a point that Martin also made, but uh, it's probably worth making twice, uh, really take advantage of the diversity of the sector. Take advantage of the diversity of the feed resources, of the species, of the technologies, etc., uh, in order to really achieve uh, uh, the most of what we can achieve in that area. Thank you very much. Great. Right, thanks, Pierre. That's that's really great. So um, now I guess we have about 20 minutes, let's say, for Q&A discussion and kind of concluding the session. Um, before I pass to the moderator of the next session on the, on the question and answer session, um, just a reminder, please, if you have questions or comments, please, you can uh, insert those into the chat. You can also, given we have a small crowd today, you can also just raise your hand and, and seek to speak directly. Um, you can do that by hovering um, your mouse above your name in the participants list and you'll see a raise hand function there. Alternatively, in the reactions icon at the bottom of your screen probably, there's also a raise hand function. Um, with that, I'll pass to uh, Dr. Harry Clark, who is uh, a technical advisor for the CCAC on agriculture. He's also the director of the New Zealand Agricultural Greenhouse Gas um, Research Centre. Uh, Harry, I'll <coughs> pass it to you to um, to moderate, and I'll encourage the panelists to please, if you can, um, turn your cameras on so we can see you. And um, yeah, Harry, the floor is yours. Many thanks, Hayden, and many thanks for all the speakers. I I think they have raised some very interesting issues that I'm sure will um, you know raise a number of questions. And could I kind of take the moderator? Uh, privilege here and ask the first question. And it does align with another question we've had from Danilo. And uh, Drew presented a compelling case for reducing methane in terms of the, the potential climate benefits um, and in, in terms of co-benefits in terms of health, etc. But Drew was talking about absolute reductions in methane. Uh, he presented uh, information around the practices um, uh, and saying these are low cost. But when we look at the case studies and when we look at um, 
methane emissions from livestock globally, it's actually going up. And what we're doing is we're presenting the case studies in terms of emissions intensity. Um, and, and Martin's slide actually showed emissions rising, but, 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 but lower than business as usual. So do we have a dichotomy here that, that seemingly um, we have uh, on one hand an argument that the ways we can reduce emissions will reduce absolute emissions. But what we're seeing in practice is we're reducing emissions intensity, but increasing emissions. And how do we balance those two things out? I think Pierre started to touch on that with the carbon, with a cap. Uh, but how do we balance those two things where we seem to have practices that reduce emissions intensity, but they're not reducing it as fast as the rise in production that occurs. So we're not actually meeting the aims that Drew was talking about in the terms of absolute climate. And that is for everyone who's spoken. I can start by providing uh, a contribution to that question. Uh, yeah, uh, I think that you know, uh, is right, and uh, the expression of uh, the emission, the, the emission, in terms of emission, is usually quite the large picture that, uh, of course, we need to reduce emission uh, from uh, uh, the absolute emission from the whole sector. So, if I of course, this was mainly a choice of uh, presenting those results because uh, of the limited time that we, we do have for this seminar. But then what I can say is that uh, for those mitigation that we tested, of course, they had a large impact on the emission, uh, uh, in terms of the emissions. For instance, if we uh, you look at uh, Ethiopia uh, in agropastoral systems or uh, in mixed rock of livestock, which is uh, mixed rock, for uh, uh, of which is the largest uh, uh, production system in, in Ethiopia, uh, only the, the supplementation of legumes reduced the uh, anthrac methane uh, by 20%. So, uh, and, and that is not the emission intensity, it's the total emissions of anthrac methane. So, meaning that uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the mitigation option, of course, should not be uh, looking at the intensity because the intensity can sometimes hide hide the absolute because if the production is, is expanding, of course, the emission intensity goes down, but the overall may not go down. So, and this is not the case, of course, for all, all mitigation emission systems, because some may reduce the emission intensity by, but increase the overall emissions. Over. Thank you, Marble. Pierre? Um, yeah. So, I would say that Two things. First, um, if we only look at methane, right, uh, then the absolute emission is obviously a result from emissions per unit at n times the volume of production, right? So, we, and, and we have situations where the volume of production is sufficiently stable that emission intensity will lead us for, to an absolute emission reduction. And uh, that's possible where we are plateauing the demand and countries, you know, probably the higher income countries that, that are, we have some situations like that, but clearly in the situation that we described for Bangladesh and Ethiopia, where we have still strong issues with uh, uh, malnutrition and especially with micronutrients that mentioned, uh, Martin, uh, Martin mentioned, um, the, the result of these two components is that the, the volume of production is growing that fast. Uh, for, for some type really for a good reason of food security that that emission with intensity reduction cannot cope so the result is an absolute increase yes right um, but I think we, we have to, to yeah, we have to consider that the second thing I would mention is that um, of course here we're talking about methane right but we I think uh, in the context of uh, broader discussion on the emission from the sector we should not only look at methane uh, and, and that's, the, for example, the case of uh, a program we designed for, for Kazakhstan, where direct emissions from entric methane and from uh, manure are going down on the emission intensity level, yes, but compensated by carbon sequestration in the grassland. So the, 
net overall emissions are going down. So I think when you broaden a little bit the focus, not only to methane, but to the other gases, uh, either emitted or potentially sequestered in the livestock system, then, then you can further expand the situations where you can reduce the absolute uh, amount of emissions, right? And just to mention one last thing, um, in the case of the biocarbon fund, the one I described uh, for, for Ethiopia, um, of course, at the jurisdiction level, we still want to see absolute emission reduction. Otherwise, there is no payment. Right? The question is, can the livestock sector be incentivized to contribute to that overall net emission reduction? Uh, and and the, 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 the way of accounting that was used before would not enable the livestock sector to receive in th those incentives and to contribute. It was just overshooting and, and, and kind of uh, uh, preventing, if you want, absolute emission reduction uh, in, in that area. Those, those, so, so I think we have to look at a little bit the broader picture. Drew, so, yeah, so, so from my perspective, I mean, so what was said that the, um, you know, that the methane emissions need to go down by 45% by 2030. Um, so, you know, I think it's a function of three drivers. You know, I mean, how far can we push, I mean, those efficiency gains? Uh, I think there is still potential, I mean, for what Pierre is saying as well, I mean, to kind of further increase those efficiency gains uh, per unit of production. Uh, I think that's one. Second, the question is, I mean, to what extent can we, you know, uh, exploit, I mean, carbon sequestration opportunities in those livestock systems and push that, you know, think about silver pastoral. Um, and third, you know, um, is of course diets. I mean, so so if you, if, if if, if overall we need to kind of be on a downward trajectory uh, from the perspective of a just rule transition, I mean, it needs to be the consumers in a developed country that need to cut back drastically, I mean, their meat consumption in order to allow countries like the population in Bangladesh, which actually a very low level of animal protein consumptions to grow. I mean, um, it cannot be, I mean, that uh, uh, given that there's no scope for further growth, I mean, that those countries, I mean, will, will, will carry the burden of, you know, bringing methane emissions down. Of course, this is going to be a very, very difficult um, discussion. Uh, the question, of course, is, I mean, to what extent, I mean, the price of meat in developed countries should reflect the true costs. I mean, so there's been a huge discussion about the hidden cost of the food system as part of the UN Food System Summit. Uh, the price of meat will need to go up. Uh, but of course, that also raises a lot of, um, you know, questions about, uh, you know, uh, you know, in those countries themselves, how just the transition is going to be, because you want to avoid a situation that in the end, I mean, meat consumption will only be a kind of, um, uh, an opportunity, what's the right word here, that only the rich can afford. Uh, and then finally, a reflection. So, you know, you know, if it's if it's true, I mean, that you can get a big bang by reducing methane emissions by 2030, I mean, it's, it's the fastest climate response, as was said in the presentation. I mean, that, that raises also the question whether there is need actually for a differentiated um, price of carbon. I mean, it actually that, that, that the credits associated with methane reductions should be higher priced, I mean, than with, uh, with CO2. Uh, this will provide, of course, further incentives in reducing those methane emissions as farmers are compensated for generating those credits. Uh, so that's a question I have actually for the first uh, presenter, whether there should be differentiated carbon prices given the uh, uh, effect. I mean that methane reductions particularly have is the fastest climate response. As I said, back to you, Drew. Thank you. Uh, I, I, it does seem to be a very difficult issue to tackle, <laughs> and that, that equity issues become very, very important. I have a question um, uh, from Catalina. 
And, and this is really around a better understanding the financial and technical needs, i.e. what kind of technical assistance is needed to lay the foundation that Pierre referred to as part of the, the lessons learned from mainstreaming SLCPs into investment projects. So it's really a question for Pierre. You re repeat the question? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 can, can you give us a, some better understanding of the types of technical assistance the technical assistance that are needed um, to lay the foundation for um, you know, reductions in SLCPs, the kind of lessons you've learned from uh, your projects in Ethiopia and Bangladesh, so that you can mainstream SLCPs into investment projects. So what are the technical assistance needed? Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> I mean, I think they are, they are, they are really plenty and, and, and very much across the board, I would say, right? Uh, so so it's it really, uh, as I said, it, there is uh, very often since the, the, we really can see the effect of the NDC in, in the overall discussion in, the, in, in countries on the need to mitigate, right? And, and, and the fact that this message has reached out now from Minister of Environment or Prime Minister to the Ministries of Agriculture, to the institutes, uh, to the private sector organizations. So the, the high level uh, uh, awareness is there, but uh, really the understanding of how this is going to be done is, is really largely missing across the board, right? It is, it's from, from the understanding of the processes of emissions. Uh, to the understanding of how we measure these emissions, to the understanding, therefore, how we, we mitigate them. So a, a lot is to build that, that knowledge that uh, uh, throughout, throughout the, uh, the, 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 those different bodies I described and, and, and ensure that there is a trust that change can actually be uh, uh, driven throughout the system in that regard. So, so I think, um, so, so Practically, that means uh, uh, training sessions on, on emissions, and, and we have started uh, together uh, with the GRA a cycle of training for Kazakhstan, where we have a large operation starting now. So uh, it's going to be initially a, a set of five uh, modules of training on, on, on GHG emission throughout the sector, uh, and we convey uh, the ministry, the institutes, the agricultural institutes, with also the, the, the private sector to attend. Of course, in the background is the preparation to the project implementation, but it's also to expose uh, those researchers, those professionals to the international networks that exist uh, on, in that area and to the potential for international collaboration on these fields and so on. So, so that's, that is one, one area and you, you basically, you name it, we, you have to work on really uh, the, 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 the full range of, uh, of dimensions here. The other part, uh, is, uh, which I think is very important, is, is more the uh, uh, institutional and, and policy orientation part, right? So, so it's how we work on public incentives, public policies, and how public policies if effectively influence the level of emission and how we can tweak that. Uh, so so that, is, that is a whole part, a different, separate part, and how we create the, the incentive for, for the practice change. Um, that is... Uh, uh, then, then here you come into more into the uh, MRV, the questions of MRV, of uh, data management uh, through the uh, Ministry of Economics, the, the, the Statistics Department, the, uh, the Ministry of Agriculture, and how all that is, is collated so we have a clear picture and, and we can reflect that in the policy ambitions. Uh, it's a whole uh, discussion around uh, public support and, and how public support is driving the sector toward certain practices or others, and how can we reorient that making, for example, in the case of Kazakhstan, as I also just mentioned, we're working on conditionality of public support to the beef sector. And this conditionality, uh, these conditions will be based on some criteria that would deliver mitigation. Uh, so, so these are the kind of things. So, so all, all those elements uh, is a second kind of area of, of work in terms of uh, dialogue and technical assistance that, that is needed. 
Uh, there is no shortage of topic that I can tell you. What about finance? You know, you said there's no shortage of things. So is there a shortage of finance to do this at scale? I mean, I, I think, I mean, there, there is not necessarily a shortage of, of finance. There is to some extent, but I, I would I would plainly say there is a shortage of capacity. Right? Uh, there is a shortage today of people who can work on these topics uh, with the uh, ex level of expertise and confidence that really uh, are able to drive change and have a high level conversation with, with uh, ministers and, and with high level uh, uh, officials in governments and, and academic uh, uh, environments in, in the countries. Uh, that, that, that there is a shortage there. That's, that's, uh, that's clear. Gary, I, I, I'd like to come in there. So um, I think overall, I mean, there's a lot of financing around, uh, but I think uh, for the purpose of this discussion, you know, um, there's actually very little climate finance that is going in the agriculture and food sector. You know, I mean, it, it, it accounts for 25 to 30 percent, I mean, whatever kind of measure you take. I mean, uh, agricultural land use change, uh, land use change of greenhouse gas emissions. And only 3%, I mean, of uh, global climate finance actually is going into agriculture and food. So if you want to reward farmers and provide incentives to farmers, I mean, to make the right investments, I mean, that actually reduce methane emissions, I mean, you need to be rewarded for it. And right now we don't see that type of climate financing to the extent that is needed, I mean, to provide the incentives to make it kind of a big shift. And, and that's something that uh, we're working on. And of course, I think um, Pierre's example in Bangladesh, I mean, showed that we're trying to move that needle, but I mean, there are all kind of complications associated with it as well. Right? But uh, so, so with that um, a clarification, back to you, Harry. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have a question from Hayden, but Hayden, do you want to ask your question yourself rather than me moderate? I think we're small enough for you to ask that question yourself. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering that, um, you know, given that methane has a short life in the atmosphere and uh, emissions of methane are not irreversible, which is not the case for carbon dioxide, which basically is permanent. Um, what, what do people think, you know, is it possible to kind of permit a transition period where these, um, these sort of win-win options that we know will likely increase total emissions of methane, but will decrease significantly the intensity, um, they may be the, the sort of short-term focus, um, which, is inevitably going to improve the economic welfare of farmers. And then maybe in the medium term, that actually presents either through being more affordable or maybe there's been some structural change in the type of farming um, that actually allows for more expensive mitigation to happen uh, in the medium term that would lead to absolute reductions. You know, So we kind of allow for a bit of a peak and then decline um, given the, the nature of livestock and, and the need to develop, right? Um, particularly in those countries with low levels of productivity today. I, in, in many ways, that would be a, an ideal question for Drew. Unfortunately, Drew has, has, has had to leave. I, I wonder if any of the other panelists would um, like to have a crack at that one. Harry, I think this is a topic you've been working on, right? <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, I, I I definitely can have a, a crack at that, and I think it really does start to become around uh, the levels of overshoot that you you can allow in terms of staying below any given you know temperature threshold, uh, because you you certainly if you trade off CO two against methane, um, more ambitious cuts in methane will will certainly ensure that you don't um, go above the one and a half degrees and then come back. So if you trade off methane against carbon dioxide, you've got a, a higher risk of overshoot, uh, even though you may stay within the one and a half degrees by say 250. And I think that's the real concern about trading off methane versus carbon dioxide. Um, but, and at the end of the day, 
whatever happens, carbon dioxide has to be reduced to zero and in virtually every model scenario has to go below uh, net zero. Uh, and so I think you do start to ask questions around, well, what kind of economic trade-off is, 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 is allowable? Because if you are saying that with livestock, what's happening is you're allowing um, greater resilience in your systems, you're setting up for a more permanent long-term reduction, and you're uh, allowing, you know, trading off um, perhaps develop economic development, maybe it, that's a better outcome than a, a no, uh, no overshoot. Um, and so I think it really starts to come around to economics and livelihoods and equity and practicality as to what trade-off you allow and, and how, um, you know, uh, what the impacts of any overshoot are. I think actually what's happening in practice is that for, for many years, and actually for decades, we've been told that there are cost-effective mitigations in the livestock sector, um, uh, and we can identify them. But what's actually happening in practice, there is a continued rise in the livestock methane. It hasn't been happening. And I think that we, the, 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 on a practical level, we definitely have to push to re any technologies that will reduce as below business as usual have to be implemented as soon as possible with a, with a, a hope uh, and an expectation that action in the developed world and I think there is certainly a very strong logic that there are some societies over consume animal products, um, that, that there will be action across all fronts that, that will allow that the economic development that livestock brings and all the cultural, social, economic issues with livestock. Um, because ultimately it's what do you lose versus what do you gain? In, in, in terms of development. And I think that any really hard pressure on methane, this is a very personal view, uh, particularly in the developed world, will actually result in adverse consequences, perhaps even worse than, than the, 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 the climate benefits. Because when Drew gives this 45%, um, you know, the bulk of that is not in livestock. The bulk of it is elsewhere and the real focus and the real easy wins are actually in fossil fuel methane, the, the leakage of, uh, uh, and I think, how do you trade those off? Is it better to say with livestock, yes, we set ourselves on a longer term trajectory of emission reduction, but accept that there is some overshoot and really push hard on the non-livestock emissions uh, because the actual global outcome will be better. That very much the personal view on that, but I think it's a discussion we have to have um, and, uh, around balancing impacts. But Pierre, I don't know whether you you have views on that as well, or wh whether anyone from the floor has a view on that. Well, I'll throw it back to you, Hayden. You know, as you know, what are your thoughts on that one before we wrap up? A somewhat loaded question. I mean, I personally think it, it's probably a pragmatic approach. Um, you know, I, this is sort of an old saying, right? Less haste, more speed. And sometimes I feel like there's a constant sort of crisis focus that maybe doesn't help. And if we were to be a bit more deliberate and long term, um, we may have these conversations in a more calm manner and think about, you know, prag pragmatically, how do we get livestock, you know, by mid century to the place where it needs to be? But recognise that there are some realities, right, in production systems. You can't just turn it off. It's not a it's not a tailpipe emission. It's a biological system, and um, as you say, Harry, there's lots of cultural, social dimensions tied up in it. So, I think it's inevitable that it's going to take time and longer than some other some other industrial sources. Thank you, Hayden. And, yeah. Um, I mean, how to say that? Not to sound. I mean, I think given the hurry, generally speaking, uh, you know, I, I'm pleased that every sector, every area moves as quickly as, 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 we, as we really can. So, so I think 
starting to say, well, methane is less important or that subsector is less important. We, we do that slower and so on. I'm not sure it leads us where we need to, to go, really. I mean, the fact is that this prioritization is, is taking place, right? Uh, Martin was mentioning uh, uh, climate finance, and, and the fact is that I think livestock is below 1% of the climate finance, right? But that's, that reflects the complexity of working with livestock. That's what it reflects. It reflects the problem of data, the real problem of MRV, of transaction costs, like that. And, and, and climate finance is much stronger in energy, uh, in transport, or energy particularly. Uh, and, and, and that reflects the relative ease of progressing in that direction. Right? Uh, and and the, the returns associated with investment in mitigation in those other sectors. So, so what, what I would like, I think what I want to say is that, you know, we don't really, I mean, we, we don't want to hold ourselves. The fact that it is more difficult in this sector than in others in any way is anyway kind of slowing us down, right? But we should still go uh, as quick as we as we can and, and push and, and, you know, attract the interest, attract support such as the CCAC is giving and et cetera, et cetera, to move on, right? And not say, well, we are special, we'll do it later. I know that's not what you're saying, but uh, you, you see where I'm, where I'm going with. For the record, I'm absolutely not saying that. <laughs> I agree with <laughs> no. you. Yeah. No, it seems to me... But we yeah, still hear it from time to time. From time, to time. There, there has to be as much ambition as you can possibly get to, and we should make every effort to reduce emissions. But there are some realities uh, around reducing emissions so um, uh, that, that we have to, to face. Um, but really, thank. I'd first, I'd really like to wrap up now and thank everyone for joining and, and also thank our panelists. And unfortunately, uh, we, we've lost Drew and we've now lost Martin as well. But thanks to Imabla and thanks to Pierre um, uh, for uh, speaking to us today and, and giving you know a, a really fascinating insight into the work you have been doing in Ethiopia and Bangladesh. And certainly look forward to catching up again um, and to hear um, you know how how it goes in in other jurisdictions and and. Um, you know, and more success stories of, of how you can balance these two things of increasing livelihoods in, you know, uh, and uh, making a positive contribution to climate change. So, and and many thanks to Catalina for organising this. Thanks to Hayden for, for chairing as well and opening the session. So, uh, wherever you are in the world, and for me, it's uh, about 3.30 in the morning, um, so bed beckons for me, but for many of you, I'm sure it's probably early in the morning. So good morning, good evening, good day, wherever you are. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you.